Have you ever wanted to be the first to know if aliens really exist? Well, with Nebula, you can be! Nebula is the streaming service that's home to its Probably Not Aliens, as well as our YouTube channels. And the best part? All of our content goes up early on Nebula. So when we break first contact with E.T., you'll be the first to find out. That's right, you'll be able to listen to the next episode of this show before anyone else. Plus, we post bonus content that you won't find any other place. And the best part? By signing up for Nebula at nebula.tv slash probably not aliens, you're directly supporting the show and both of us. So don't wait any longer. Join Nebula today and be the first to know if this time it really is aliens. This is, we're not doing a cold open today. We're okay. done with cold opens forever, at least hottest for right of now. This is the hottest of openings. Why? Why are we doing that? Not because of anything serious, necessarily. We just figured at some point, someone listening, this might be their first episode. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, you maybe you don't want to hear two random people that you don't know about rambling on about nothing. Maybe you want to get right into the aliens and the UFOs and fun things like that. So what if we do that? What if we just give up this thing that we've been doing for over a hundred episodes? Stop goofing around. Just all content. No, no. At least, at yeah. least everyone. Was at least for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, this is a podcast called It's Probably Not Aliens. Wow, we just got right into it. Yeah. This is, yeah. What do we do on this podcast? Great question. We look at ancient astronaut theory and the TV show Ancient Aliens, and we debunk them or look into those claims while learning about real world history, philosophy. Not really. I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I, I went into the, my what pitch for my aliens? YouTube channel. Why is aliens? We look at real world history of people, places, things, objects, artifacts, events, things like that. Uh, and hopefully along the way you learn about some cool stuff. My name, I'm one of the hosts of the two of us. My name is Scott. I don't know anything. I'm just like you. Maybe worse than you. Probably worse than you. I don't know anything. I just show up and I sit in front of this microphone. Sometimes I stand, but that's that's the, that's the, that's the extent of my role. My name is Tristan Johnson and I... I, I, I know too much. That, that should be our thing. I know nothing and I know too much. <laughs> That's right. We balance each other out. But yeah, the whole idea is that in 2021, we started a podcast called It's Probably Not Aliens. And it would be a fun romp where we look into claims of ancient it's, astronaut theories and things. It's this one. It's, it's this, this podcast you're listening to right now. The thing, though, is that in the years since we started this podcast in 2021, UFOs have had a comeback. And uh, we've had the the beginning of the UAP task force and just UFO talk has been humongous in the last few years. It's been very great for our stock, but it also means that this podcast's coherence has had to give some way to the fact that we are now uh, doing pseudo history, pseudo archaeology, ancient astronaut theory, but also uh, conspiracy theories with a science fiction bend to them. And of course, now uh, just UFOs and all that kind of stuff. We're just like, we're just, we just became that. It's yeah. probably not aliens. Uh, anything where we can say that it's probably not aliens, that's probably where we belong. <laughs> This is why it's specifically why we chose the name of this podcast that we did, because we could have called it like debunking ancient aliens or something like that. But sometimes we want to cover stuff that the show hasn't even covered. And we just want to talk about aliens, especially right now. As you're saying, there has been a resurgence, an increase in UFOs and UAP reports and sightings. And it's on it's it's in the mainstream again. Aliens. Yeah. When we watched when we went to ancient aliens live which was an episode that we did not too long ago you can listen to that when we went to their live show they were saying at the end of it that like how much main how much in the mainstream that aliens and ufos and uaps are now and how it doesn't seem to a lot of people that ridiculous nowadays so we want to be on those front lines with you all yeah and so today is uh, uh an update basically to an episode we did about maybe like a year and a half ago but also a sort of general look for anybody who has been curious about what what in the fuck is, is going oh so it's an explicit tag podcast what, what yeah what, sorry what in the what in the uh he double hockey sticks is going on with what uh, in that ass 
what in the ass? What in the bastard is going on with this? And so I thought that it would be really good. Uh, you know, this is one of our, you know, behind the scenes. This is one of this is our last recording of 2023. So we're kind of uh, both entering into the holiday season, which sounds like a relaxing time, but it's actually like one of the most stressful nope. times for content creators. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> uh, yeah. So as we're kind of entering into it, I wanted to put this thing together. This actually started as a Galactic Gazette um, uh, piece that kind of just grew out of control. And uh, I wanted to give uh, a good opportunity also for new listeners to the show to kind of get a overhaul of basically like America's relationship with UFOs and how it links from like the past to today and who all the people are and what the thing. So it's like, this is like who your, are the main character. Yeah. This is like your yeah. 30,000 foot view of what the fuck is going on. <laughs> What's happening in this space. This is your podcast to know all about it. And this episode specifically mm-hmm. is a nice little overview. Yeah. What are the names? Who are the main characters? What are the things? What all these, all these sightings and the themes, all this good stuff. Yeah. Uh, to kind of go in more very broad sense, uh, people have been seeing things in the sky forever because, well, because birds exist. Yeah. Birds exist. Bugs exist, but also um, clouds, learned, clouds yeah. exist. The sun weather does weird things there's a lot of different mm-hmm. reasons why people will see strange stuff in the sky and or, or will interpret normal stuff in the sky in very strange ways and in recent times specifically you can um you can look into this that uh since world war ii specifically uh but mm. also since like the dawn of like science fiction film in general uh there has been instead of uh, interpreting these as angel sightings or battles in heaven they've been interpreted as uh ufos flying flying saucers, any of those kinds of things. Uh, pro- interestingly, time for a period in which all of the major world powers were starting to develop more advanced uh, aerospace technology, and the Cold War led to a lot of countries developing a lot of new aerospace technology in secret. Ah, so it could be a it could be misinterpreting those things, or it could be us uh, kind of working through our discomfort with the fact that we are living in a world where countries are becoming more and more powerful, and that sure. they have a growing uh, disconnection with the people that they have, and they feel less need to be honest with us about what they're doing. And oftentimes, what they're doing has the development of things with heavy destructive capabilities. So, I, so with all that said, yeah, so the, yeah, all that said, that's sort of my if you. Want wanted like the sort of TLDW or TLDL version of what Tristan thinks basically UFOs are. It's that. Um, the other thing though, in, is that in recent days we have, um, I mean, now anybody with a couple hundred bucks can buy a drone and militaries are developing very advanced drone technology. And uh, very often as, as that becomes more of a normal phenomenon, yeah. the U S like uh, the U S is having to figure out how to, track and report if enemy countries are developing new advanced drone technology for spying or for possibly other, you know, more malicious activities. But because of the association of, you know, identifying a thing in the sky that you don't recognize with aliens and science fiction stuff, that it has caused a stigma. And so a lot of like the UAP stuff in recent days has been about like, hey, please report on this stuff because we don't want like people have had their careers ruined for reporting things they saw in the sky and then people thinking it's aliens. And they're like, well, now there's like, like there's legitimate spy craft and it's like been linked to things like, you know, nearby Russian subs and stuff. And so like this shouldn't be stigmatized. We had a whole episode about UAPs and how UFOs have sort of had that rebrand to UAP. And this is part of it. Not only is UAP more accurate because it, it, you know, if you see something in the sky, it doesn't necessarily, number one, it doesn't have to be flying. That's like a, a specific verb that it might not actually be doing. And number two, it might not even be an object. It could just be, you know, UAP unidentified aerial phenomena. Uh, it could just be like the, uh, the sun reflecting. We talk about sun dogs or things like that, or just like the way that uh, clouds look or, or the way that this, you know, light can reflect or refract and things like that. So it might not even be necessarily an object. It could just be a trick of the light. And again, it's just in the sky. It doesn't necessarily have to be flying. So UAP is more accurate than UFO, but it also has that benefit 
of being less stigmatized because UFO has become such a big like science fiction-y conspiracy theorist sort of like term that most that everybody knows. UAP is like a sort of rebrand of it that is like, okay, but these things are do happen though. There are things in the sky that we that are unidentified that we do need to f- figure out what they are. And we don't want people to feel like if they report it that their careers are going to be ruined because people are going to think they're a crank, that they're just like, you know, that, that, that they're a, a quack in some capacity of just like, well, clearly we can't take this person seriously. They're claiming UFOs? No. So UAP, I think, was a, a necessary rebrand of, of it for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. yeah. And, and so while this like was existing in the air, uh, things started to get more serious in the 2000s as, uh, as things move forward. The big thing that I think that we need to mention is that in 2004, there was the Tic Tac incident, which really uh, made the sort of set of what we're seeing today go off. So in 2004, which was now, I guess, 20 years ago, because it's 2024 now, uh, during a training mission off the coast of California, a retired Navy pilot commander encountered a UAP. It was described as resembling a white Tic Tac about the size of a fighter jet, which is about 40 feet, had no wings and was hovering near the water. The main things that stuck out as being weird weird is that it didn't have what's called rotor wash, which is a visual disturbance caused by helicopter blades, which meant that it has some kind of propulsion or ability to hover that defied what we know about how these kinds of vehicles function. Yeah, it's not like how an airplane or a a helicopter hovers by like pushing air downward, basically, uh, which would disturb the water. This is not doing that. Exactly. Uh, the UAP began mirroring the, mo- uh, the movements of the pilots as they attempted to pursue it, suggesting that it was aware of their presence. I would also argue that that also uh, is a sign that it might be an optical illusion, which I think a lot of people are starting to suggest it is now. I, yeah, that would have been my first thought, to be honest. Yeah. Just uh, that, putting my bias out there. That would have been my first thought. Yeah. Uh, it's also uh, d- d- demonstrated to move rapidly and evade uh, different things, moving very quickly, moving away from sight, being detected in 60 miles away in less than a minute which also generally implies like the, the problem is that like optical illusion is the main thing to go to but this stuff has been caught on camera this stuff has been caught on multiple sensors so this is where things get a little interesting because okay the tic-tac incident could very well be explained by being an optical illusion but there's a little bit more to it that suggests there might be something more interesting and we talked about this in the uap episode yes. but this is why people might suggest that it might be something that is like what's called electronic warfare which is uh when you design things to basically Basically, fuck with an enemy's sensors. Mm, and yeah, if things yeah, are like yeah. moving at unnatural speeds, it could be something like that. Is it also possible that it's a viral marketing campaign for Tic Tacs? Ooh, if so, because I am craving some right now. It's working yes. on me. If so, Tic Tac, I have a bone to pick with you. Um, I'm very, uh, so Tic Tac last year you released, you had a, you did a collab with Coca-Cola. It was one of the greatest moments of my adult life because Coca-Cola flavored Tic Tacs were so good and it was temporarily, it was a temporary measure and now it is done. Okay. And I really want Coca-Cola flavored Tic Tacs again. (laughs) We need them back. I've not had one of these. This sounds amazing. I love when they make soda flavored candies. We had soda flavored like gummies for, um, hollow. We, we handed out last Halloween. Mm-hmm. Um, and we actually kept a whole bunch for ourselves cause they were delicious. Yeah. I, um, there's Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola flavored gummies are like one of my favorites. I, uh, I buy, uh, what's it called? There's like, uh, there's like those keto candies. those like non sugar candies that you can buy. Oh, yeah. that are, they have Coca-Cola ones that are really good or, um, Coca-Cola flavored gummies where you only eat one because you're going to have a very interesting evening afterwards. Uh, all those things oh, are my I faves. See. Um, <laughs> Both of those. There's two different not, types. For the record, that is not what we handed out to children for Halloween. All right. No. Shit, no, man, I couldn't afford that. No, we're keeping that to ourselves, baby. It's like, it's like 30 bucks for like five of them. Like, no. Yeah, no one's handing out their best stuff to children. Kids aren't getting free drugs. No. That's the main part when like people are like, people are giving marijuana laced uh like uh uh gummies to kids. And I was like, do you know how expensive no. that shit is? Like, like no I'm one's, no one's giving away hundreds of dollars of free stuff. Anyways. Um, the other thing too, is that this had no distinctive features, no visible markings, no wings, no exhaust plumes. And these are typically seen on aircraft. So it was a very weird thing. Yeah. Hence why it was, I guess, nicknamed a tick. It looks like a little tic-tac. Yeah. Tic-tacs don't have wings. 
Everyone knows this. So when this was reported, uh, no one was able to explain what it was. When it was reported, uh, this person's career got uh, sidetracked because it was, uh, you know, it was uh, associated with UFOs. Oh, you're seeing little green men, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that mm-hmm. person became a little bit marginalized uh, in yep. the sort of Air Force infrastructure. To give a little bit of historical context on UFOs. Uh, oh, I love that. We have been seeing like the modern UFO phenomenon. You could probably say started uh, in 1947. Uh, the first one would be the Kenneth Arnold uh, would be the, with Kenneth Arnold sighting in 1947, where a private pilot reported seeing nine disc shaped objects near Mount Rainier in Washington that were traveling at over a thousand miles per hour and called them flying saucers, which led to a surge in reports across mm. the country. So that's if you want your origin, there it is in the same that's year the flying saucer mm-hmm. in the same year, a, uh, a test balloon that was used for detecting the acoustic sounds of Soviet, uh, Soviet nuclear explosions, uh, went down at Roswell, uh, which was interpreted by the local news to be a crashed UFO, basically hot on the heels of the Mount Rainier incident. So they, uh, the, the local news thought it was a crashed flying saucer. People were thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was redacted the next day, but, uh, this basically became the, the birth of modern UFOs and the idea that the government is secretly working on them. Well, if it was redacted the next day, that only makes it more suspicious, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. (laughs) And we've done an episode about Roswell as well. If you want to listen to that, if this is your first episode of ours, yeah, we're we're making suggestions for you. Mm -hmm. And remember, my name is Scott and his name is Tristan. Just to reintroduce ourselves (laughs) again, in case you've already forgotten. We will be doing this every five minutes for the rest of the podcast. We'll just start over every (laughs) Um, uh, the other thing too, is that in 1952, so only five years later, Washington DC had some, uh, unexplained sightings through their radar scopes at Washington national airport and at, uh, Andrews air force. They've picked up mysterious blips, which got national headlines and raised concerns within the Truman administration that led to a series. Again, all of these would lead to increased, uh, reports of sightings of, uh, of UFOs, but this was the beginning of the government taking an interest in UAPs. Mm. Um, then in Suffolk, UK in 1980, the Rendlesham forest incident uh the u.s air uk and u.s air force ident- uh, stationed at the raf woodbridge uh reported sightings of interactions with the uap often dubbed britain's roswell again drawing a lot of attention that's why britain is also has a very developed like you know ufo task force then uh to, to spur- copy off of us huh <laughs> Exactly. To spur another recent, because uh, the 1990s were uh, marked by many UFO incidents, mostly because of the popularity of the X-Files, but also because of a wave in 1989 and 1990 of seeing triangular UAP sightings in Belgium. Uh, thousands mm-hmm. of people reportedly reported on this, but uh, and even the Belgian Air Force tried to intercept these using the most advanced flying waffles they possibly could, yep. uh, but they were unsuccessful. Their chocolate missiles were not able to intercept with them. They weren't able to do it. With their, with their little, with their, I think their waffles were too deep, too, too thick, too fluffy. Yeah. I was, I was going to say sorry to Belgium, but I'm not sorry. Belgium knows what it did. <laughs> they made delicious breakfast and destroyed Congo. Uh, Europe. as well. Europe, delicious food, T- terrible history. <laughs> Europe, where no one is innocent. Nope. Uh, so then, so, so so that's like the sort of history that led. And then in 2004, we have this reporting and all of a sudden the government is taking another interest. There was Project Blue Book in the interim, which was the, uh, was the government trying to make a, uh, where they, they took down a lot of documented reports of UFOs and explained away most of them and kind of came to the conclusion that it was probably nothing uh, or what people were seeing that were something was something that the government did not want people knowing about because it was probably, you know, experimental aircraft or um, or things that were not exactly legal that the government was doing um, mm. as they do today. Now, uh-huh. the government is taking seriously the idea of trying to explain what UAPs are, because if they are natural phenomenon, it would be good to explain them away. But also if they aren't natural phenomenon and they are, say, Russians or the Chinese developing new advanced forms of drones or electronic warfare or anything else that the government of the United States is probably interested in figuring out what that is so they can either do it themselves or at least find ways to counter it. Mm -hmm. So this has led to a bunch of different people. And these are sort of the main characters. First, as we talked about in the Galactic Gazette episode, NASA put together an independent study team of 16 people that were tasked with investigating the UAP phenomenon. And they basically concluded that they need to make a permanent phenomenon uh, or a permanent task force uh, that is going to investigate these in the future involving using artificial intelligence and the, you know, the state of the art analytics technologies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's I mean, I think it's a good thing 
that that people are actually taking some of this stuff seriously. Again, if this is your first podcast you've ever listened to us, we're not in the business of saying that there aren't aliens out there. We're just saying a lot of the times we look at historical context and, and things like this, like we're doing right now, and saying, well, there are other explanations that seem more likely. Yeah. Um. And so we were happy that I feel like, I feel like, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I'm happy people are looking to stuff like this and, and, and trying to figure out what these UAPs are. Yeah. My take is that it would be really cool if it was aliens, but I'm very skeptical yeah. given the physics, given the, what we know about physics and how, uh, like the distances involved and the amount of power that would be needed to do things like this. Like the idea, like, so I think cool. I talked about this, like how Roswell, uh, is supposed to be a UFO crash. And I would say that like, if something could, uh, spin up to like something approaching relativistic velocities, like even a decent percentage of the speed of light and, uh, could crash land on earth, uh, that would be like if, if if something like that were to crash on Earth, it would take out half the solar system with it because of how much energy you would need to do something like that. Um, yeah, just the kinetic force. And keep in mind, kinetic force is no is no small thing. There was actually this program to instead of using nuclear weapons, there was this plan. And I can't believe this is this is a real thing. But the idea was that they would have a satellite with these really heavy tungsten rods that'd be flown. Oh into yeah, space. I know this. And then yeah. they would just drop them on cities, and they would have so much kinetic force that they would like basically have the power of a nuclear bomb without the radiation that was like a plot point in one of the call of duty games i think oh was it i've never played call of duty so i don't know i don't remember someone will correct me hey we do corrections episodes sometimes if you're just if you're listening to this podcast <laughs> you're for the really, first time you're really acting as the the, the, the it's probably not alien this could guys. be someone's first episode i don't know that's the whole My point name is scott he's <laughs> tristan <laughs> um yeah another person to mention is that uh the associate administrator for the science mission directorate at nasa's headquarters named thomas zerbuchin or zubrukin is one of the bigger person who's talking about uh the importance of looking at big data and analyzing the mass amounts of things to figure out what uaps are and also that uh after the report came out the uh, nasa had to put together a new a director of uap research who is trying to shift the conversation away from sensationalism and focus on the science uh so this is the new thing that's moving forward but then outside of like scientific inquiry the department of defense which obviously is very interested in like these potentially being enemy aircraft are also looking into it uh the big person there is sean kirk kirkpatrick who's the director of the all domain anomaly resource office or aaro uh and is trying to look into the pentagon's task force for studying uaps the aaro coordinates efforts across federal agencies and tries to detect identify and attribute mysterious objects in the air space and underwater so this is now like showing how much the government's taking it seriously that they have this yeah. guy and they are definitely much more focused on trying to find threats uh they to- got a guy with three names in his name we got sean kirkpatrick it's true and kirkpatrick is just the last name but it's a last name that has two other first names in it that's how much they're that's how serious they're taking this he actually merged his two names because uh, we all know that people who uh, have three first names as their name tend to assassinate presidents like that Lee Harvey true. Oswald and John Wilkes. That is true. Uh, I do. I mean, this one person with these three names condensed into two names is a task force in and of himself. That's how much they're taking that they're taking this so seriously. Yeah, it's a big deal. Uh, another big person to to know about is a guy named Garrett Graff, who's a journalist who chronicles the who's been chronicling the uh, evolution of the UAP tracking program. Mm -hmm. Uh, He has a critical perspective on the intersection of government efforts and the public fascination with UAPs. So he's trying to like tell us about what the UF, the UAP like, you know, task force is up to, but at the same time is uh, trying to, you know, you know, get, get those, get those clicks from the, the UFO or because the thing is about these things, this is I think a lot of why the government is being the way it is, is that they knew the second that these things would go public. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, like, or not for unfortunately, but they did end up going public because uh, most things in the American government should be public unless they have a very good reason for it not to be. And mm-hmm. so they went forward with this and uh, established that like this is uh, like they knew that when they were going to do this, that it was going to create uh, a whole wave because there's a lot of people who want the UFOs to be, to be aliens. And so they need to figure out a way to talk about this in a way that, you know, spurs interest increases NASA and the Pentagon's budget, but doesn't result in us being like, is it aliens? Maybe aliens. Mm. Unfortunately, that has not worked. Hasn't worked. Yeah. And so many people have talked about their own UAP findings. If they saw UAPs while they were in the military and that has uh, spurred up things and also has led to things like UAP X, 
Hacks, which is a Florida-based nonprofit that is trying to uh, investigate uh, things. Uh, furthermore, I don't know if this is UAPX, is that, but there is the one that was started by you, a former member of Blink-182. Oh, nice. I was going to say you could tell me that UAPX is another Elon company Musk that debacle. E- Elon Musk latched onto and was like, how about this one has an X now too? And I would believe you. Uh, if anyone remembers the name of Tom Tom DeLong's DeLong. uh, UFO charity that he started when he kind of went crazy and left Blink-182. <laughs> Damn. Hey, new album's good though. Listen to that new yeah. album? It's a good album. Blink-182 basically ended because Tom DeLong was too obsessed with UFOs. Wow. We all have our... Devices. All of our things, yeah. <laughs> so suppose, yeah. Uh, if I were to gauge how, like, how many nerd sync videos has Baldur's Gate eaten? Like oh, at least so one. Many. <laughs> <laughs> so many. I am. So, I am so lost in this game right now. It's so, why is it so good and why is it so big? <laughs> I don't get it. I made a joke in one of my recent videos that I I'm like 200 hours in and I just got to actual the the physical gate of Baldur's Gate. Like I actually got to Baldur's Gate in the game called Baldur's Gate. And I'm realizing now, I don't even think that's true, Tristan. I think I just got a waypoint that is around Baldur's Gate, but I haven't even been to Baldur's Gate yet. Oh my goodness. How big is this game? Oh man, I look forward to beating it in three years when Baldur's Gate 4 is being announced or something. I, I imagine it's going to be way yeah. more than four years. But, uh, it, yeah, it'll be announced soon enough, but it's going to take another decade to, to get it out there, which is <laughs> fine. Take time. This game is big and good, and I want play the next one to also times. be big and good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll play one every decade. Their, uh, their previous one, Divinity Original Sin 2, which came out in 2017, is also very, very good. So if you, if you want a follow-up... <laughs> Go play we'll to do the original it. Sin 2, where elves uh, learn facts about the world by eating people. So this is another thing that we do on the podcast sometimes. Just get distracted Tristan by and shit. and I both have ADHD, and we'll sometimes just talk about nerdy shit for a little bit, and we'll forget that we're doing a podcast. Yes, okay. And you'll okay, get used to okay. it, and you'll think it's, you'll, you'll get used to it, and you'll think it's really charming, and you'll grow to love it, like we do. People do enjoy it. Yeah, I think so. I'm not hating on it. I'm just, uh, I'm informing people. I just got it. We got an email this morning that was a big list of Minecraft mods I should check out. So obviously people are engaging with it in some capacity. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, okay. So uh, let's also talk about like the reason why this is uh, so like, why it's a big deal. So first in 2023, there was a notable increase in uh, analyzed UAP reports. So people have been reporting a lot more U- uh, UAPs and the government has been taking it seriously. So more shit's happening, which I would argue is probably because there's more drones in in the sky. Uh, as I said, I think that I think I said in a podcast episode a long time ago that I think that one of the things that will be like the most like you know how when you see like a, a visual image of like a visual image as opposed to an audio image, but like yeah. <laughs> when you see like a, a those like picture, sort of yeah. old photographs from like, you know, a hundred years ago and you can kind of juxtapose it with like how different things are today. I think yeah. that the main visual difference from like the date, the time that we were born to like the time, like when we were like, you know, when we die, like in our life, our like lifespan is going yeah. to be that the sky is going to look a lot more busy. Cause I think that once uh, drones and once the battery, cause we have like this whole bottleneck with battery it's batter- technologies. Batteries are, are, bi- are a big uh, <laughs> sink into like uh, technology right now. Yeah. Just like that is ha- the limit on, certain technologies we've got to figure out better batteries but there's a handful of uh battery breakthroughs and if any of them work out uh and we can have batteries that can hold more energy with less weight then uh i think that the sky is going to be yeah much busier in the future and that we're going to see more drones just doing things like delivery drivers will be gone it'll just be drones delivering stuff yeah. Uh, just just drones doing all sorts of fun things. Yeah. And like, you and know, also not fun things. Upsides and downsides. Like, I think that also uh, a lot of drone drone stuff is going to replace things that cars used to do. And the fewer cars there are on the road, the better. That's I would true. Uh, as somebody who's louder. Yeah. Drones are pretty loud, but they can go higher up. So you don't have to hear them. That is also true. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. I miss, the, I miss the time and when we're developing new rotors to make them quieter. So they are getting better. Yeah. At that too. And I, I, I miss the time is, you know, it, in, in my parents' lifetime, if they were to look back at an old picture to be like, juxtapose it with their stuff, it would just be that like people in the 1920s just wore hats more often <laughs> in the, versus today. Yeah. Whereas we're just like the, sky will be filled will be shadowed in drones well i I guess i I guess that's an extreme way to talk about it but there will like the idea of seeing a unmanned robotic 
flying machine going over your head yeah. doing various things will not be like a weird thing it'll just be like a kind of like part of like you know like just seeing cars driving around yeah and uh that, i think that'll be a thing uh in the near term future as like i said the battery the battery thing just is gotta like fix the main these thing. batteries yeah. yeah uh the other thing too is that the government's taking it more seriously as we talked about with the aaro and nasa that they are pro they're they're taking these reports more seriously so they're processing more of them that's why they reported uh over 800 hundred sightings in 2023 uh mm-hmm. which was which is a significant increase from the year before uh and now they're reporting that they are getting dozens of these monthly with the expectation that they're going to have hundreds if not thousands more uh which you know card in the horse i think this might be like a little bit of like because they're taking it more seriously more people are reporting them because people are thinking about it more and we've kind of mm. seen in the history of ufos and uaps that people have a habit of seeing more ufos the more they are reported on makes sense to me then also so in July, there was a hearing uh, in Congress on UAPs that drove further public attention because of David Grush saying that I have I don't have any evidence myself, but I have this piece of paper and I know a guy and that guy says that it's non-human intelligences, which made everybody like lose their shit. But, uh, you know, he wasn't able to produce pictures or pull a little any alien out of his hat or anything yeah. um so that has uh like that is you know it's unconvincing to me but it's enough to again drive more attention and again drive more reports and that's kind of probably why you're hearing about it so much it also doesn't necessarily now that i'm thinking about it mean it doesn't necessarily mean that it's aliens it's just non-human so what if there's it's like beavers <laughs> what if yeah what if beavers are just like fucking way smarter than we thought they were beaver dams if you think about it are created by non-human intelligences they built dams they can build more they'll <laughs> build a high a flying one they'll Man. do it isn't there like a, a game? sky dam there's like an entire like uh like damming based city builder that's about being a build uh, a beaver like being like anthropomorphic beavers who build stuff it's like oh, called yeah. timberborn or something like that Porn. It, no, it's I, I'm See, not even joking. It's like a real game. That's good. That's fun. Um, and it's like about like the main thing is that the 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 big shtick, like the big interesting thing about the game is that you have to like manage running water. And so if you make a dam, you're gonna like you know cl- like you're gonna have overflow and where do you get the water and like managing where that goes and stuff like that is part of the game. Oh, I have so and many then, games. So think about beavers doing that, but and then they could do it in the sky, maybe. Yeah, sky Their tails. They can flap their tails so much that they fly up into into the into the like, big, like, like beautiful like tails blue. in uh, Sonic. Yeah, exactly. I like oh, man. I really want. Uh, I was just thinking about that. Like it's all the video games, I never have time to play. Anyways, uh, m- the other thing too is that a lot of UAP sightings tend to happen near restricted military airspace, which means that you know, huh. this is why people are kind of uh, having issues. Like this is why the government's taking it seriously, and also is kind of the implication that this might be spies spies or yeah. electronic warfare or something of the, of the thing uh the annual uap report which came out from the defense department and the office of the director of the national intelligence uh highlighted that there's ongoing investigations and that none of the uap reports have at this point been definitively attributed to any foreign activities there's still they still haven't uh many like the thing about uh the uaps like they got 800 plus reports and i don't know how many they've processed and investigated but like the thing that nasa has talked about too is that like the vast majority of them have an explanation only a mm. few of them have like some question marks around them that they need to investigate so it just shows like there's like a sort of a decent amount of stuff and so they're trying to figure out what these are sure if they are dangerous yeah and maybe maybe uh in the process advance scientific understanding and how we can actually study these things might also like when these kinds of investigations happen we'll learn more ways to analyze data to to figure out more stuff and science will benefit from the process absolutely sort of like a scientific keynesianism so uh there's different forces though at play and the problem is that we basically have skeptics believers and the government so skeptics Mm. like us have pointed out that uap sightings and misinterpretations are probably made of like you know man-made objects or natural phenomenon or hoaxes there's so many ufo twitter posts that are like so obviously hoaxes but they're like posted as real things that it's actually like shows how easy it is to do so um and we and and skeptics want to look into this with uh rigorous scientific investigation and that if you want to say that this is like a uap is indeed of extraterrestrial 
extraterrestrial uh, origin. You're going to need some serious fucking evidence to to convince yes, people. Yes, huge, big claims require big evidence. Yeah, and uh, and that would involve you know hearings, independent congressional investigations, clarity, and uh, you know active work debunking and va- or or validating UAP claims. Like so, that's why like I think that it's important for this work to do this because the more ways that we like deeply investigate it, take it seriously and not dismiss it out of hand, the more we can just kill this story that like that aliens have come to Earth and are fucking with our everyday lives. For funsies. For funsies. The believers want to interpret that UAPs are a sign of extraterrestrial life or advanced technology that we do not understand because it is being made by like, you know, the deep state or something. Sure. Um, And I've argued that the volume and consistency of these reports, especially from military personnel who they consider credible, uh, warrant serious investigation people like david grush as i mentioned earlier are real believers who have talked about who have like real credentials and have said that they believe it is aliens so there is like there's people who have said big things uh and they represent a a large faction of people who are very invested in you know i would say to the point where they have confirmation bias in a way that they really really want this to be aliens and they uh, are relying on a lot of hearsay and not relying a lot on like you know physical tangible evidence yeah the government in the meanwhile is in the middle of this and basically just wants to put down the historical dismissiveness of UAPs in order to take them more seriously to figure out whether or not they're threats to the country. That's basically the main thing. That's um, really all it is. They're, I feel like they're less focused on is it aliens and they're more focused on what country is doing this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, in the meantime, uh, so here's here's how the government has responded to all this. The Department of Defense put together the ARO in 2022 to investigate things. Uh, their mission is to detect, track, analyze, and manage UAPs. Uh, they have improved their data collection and reporting system on UAPs through this so that there is a centralized, standardized way to report and analyze these, uh, which then turns into sort of like a systematic process, which there wasn't one before. So that's also can explain why there are just so many of them. Um, yeah. They have made it like an intentional, like intelligence collection and analysis plan uh, and a secure reporting mechanism so that there's a secure channel for employees, service members or contractors to report directly to the ARO and not like, you know, not worry about having their reputations uh, attacked as a result. Sort of like a whistleblower, but for (laughs) for for things in the skies. Right. And they uh, plan to as they, you know, but through standardizing and analyzing, they'll hopefully be able to understand either scientifically or through you know intelligence reasons what these are and what to do about them nasa did an independent study that we talked about in the galactic gazette which is a bunch of aerospace personnel people who know physics and science who are trying to focus more on a data-driven analysis and use this to understand it from like a kind of position of scientific inquiry Mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, that uh, rather than like you know a military thing and uh Furthermore, Trust those numbers, a bunch yeah. of nerds over at NASA. That's their thing. They're wonderful nerds. I love them. They're yeah. the best wonderful nerds. They're the most wonderful of nerds. Uh, also, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, have looked into the, have also set up a committee to try and focus on detecting, characterizing and evaluating these to because uh, they're focused on basically like aerospace safety. So they're worried about mm-hmm. like these things entering and like being a danger to like airplanes and stuff. Yeah. Don't want stuff to crash into each other in the sky. Mm -hmm. But then you have other people like the Galileo Project. So the Galileo Project is led by Avi Loeb, who is kind of this uh, grifter who calls everything Uh uh, potentially aliens. Uh, His main thing, the the main thing is that he levers the fact that he is a Harvard professor to uh, Mm. try and push for all these things. Like he's the person who said that Oumuamua might have been a solar sail. uh, And he's like, you know, Uh. uh, recently come back from excavation uh, looking for these metal balls that were found in the water, assuming that they were also of extraterrestrial origin. There is uh, Angela Collier, who's like one of my favorite YouTubers, made a amazing video detailing like not only is Avi Loeb like a bit of a crank when it comes to this kind of stuff, but also his like, uh-huh. scientific bona fides. Uh, like he 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 touts that he like publishes or has credit on tons and tons of articles and it's because he publish he can get he's like established enough that he can get almost anything he writes published and he writes yeah. a lot of journal articles that are like what if th- what if somebody did this didn't do- doesn't do an experiment doesn't do like a full full study to figure it out but he's just like this is an interesting he's idea just asking the question publish you know, this he's just asking else will questions yeah. here's a big question i have publish it and put phd at the end of my name i assume exactly 
Uh, uh, so, so the Al- Avi Loeb uh, leads the Galileo project, which is obviously trying to lean into the whole idea that like the 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 the, the, the Catholic Church is censoring us, or or you know, because uh, Galileo for saying that you know the Earth revolves around the Sun, I believe, was uh, censored by the Church. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. Every fucking asshole uh, who thinks that they're telling truth to power since has uh, tried to always use brought Galileo. this up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> always brought up this exact. Well, you know, they said Galileo was 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 he was obviously onto something, but they didn't want him to. They didn't. They wanted to hide it. They wanted to shut that shit down. Mm-hmm. Much like everything that's going around with everything that I believe. Yeah. So, so obviously, uh, Avi Loeb is uh, is basically comparing himself to one of the greatest astronomers in history to uh-huh, try and uh-huh. uh, tell that story uh, again. After the NASA did their UAP project, they started. They created a research director role uh, to fill. Well, they, I don't know if they filled it yet, but as of now, they're they're plan is to have a uap research director Can and i make a suggestion to <clears throat> nasa get a person with three first names then it'll feel like a one person task force there you go that's my Perfect. suggestion tom dick henry if there's the one tom person dick who's henry. named tom dick henry you are ready this is made for you <laughs> this is for you does Sean Kirkpatrick have a sister? Jessica Kirkpatrick. Just Kirkpatrick. Or, or you know, one of those people, like, I don't know if this is, uh, I think it's true in some parts of America, but like in Canada, like if you live in Quebec, there are people who have like, like, uh, like one of the most common names is Jean-Francois. So if we've got mm. Jean-Francois Kirkpatrick, that's four names. That's four four whole names yeah that's how you do it then you and get the a best catholic part you is, make sure they're high, they're catholic so they have a confirmation name too and the best part is you only have to pay them one, one salary. person's salary and that's like four to five people all right we need to that find you okay, got we got more all right so you have to have you have to have a hyphenated first name like you are yep. uh like like a french canadian also they yeah. have to be arab in some capacity because arabs have a much longer naming convention like i think they have like like kind of like how okay. we have first middle and last names they have like five different names that are part of sure. their sort of naming conventions just um, get fucking juni from spy kids he's his whole name is long is like a paragraph that's awesome and if we could just get the person who has the most condensed amount of first names in one name <laughs> that would be yeah that's why he was like the best spy that's why in the in that whole saga they he was like number one spy is because he was a whole team of spies because he had a big long name and it was great and i loved every time when they got to say the whole name as like a password or something it was fun beautiful we could also get um who's that woman from uh from invincible who can turn herself into multiple different people uh replicate or duplicate yeah duplicate duplicate duplicate. yeah yeah uh, get her get duplicate we've got we've got uh, nasa we've got options we've got ideas (laughs) call us we have ideas yeah um and again uh, all of this is to try and move away from sensation to science and and approach this from various different angles using you know real scientific methods um Mm. And I think that the main things that uh, the main reactions have been, uh, people have been wanting this to be a transparent process uh, because so people have argued that, you know, they should when, when we're reporting on UAPs, they should be transparent and they've called for congressional hearings and more transparency from the military and intelligence agencies about this, because if it is aliens, people have the right to know. And I would argue that that is the case. I don't think that, you know, uh, like I think there's a, there's an advocacy group called Americans for Safe Aerospace uh, and also declassify UAP that are pushing for changing policies to be more open about what they are finding, which I think would be great mm-hmm. because if they could publicly publish all of the things and what they think they are, that might help somewhat. Um, there's also just conspiracy theories. Like many conspiracy theorists uh, think that the uh, the UAP information is being secretive because they're covering up that they actually do know that it's like, you know, UFOs or whatever. Um, and that this is just a front to try and dissuade us from the very real thing that is that aliens have somehow managed to break the light speed barrier and get to earth mm-hmm, somehow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Somehow. Yeah. Uh, we'll and, ask questions when we meet them. Mm-hmm. And as we learned at our, sh- at our show or at the live show that they feel like. No, not our show. No. <laughs> we went to someone else. We went to Ancient Aliens Live. Yeah. As we learned at Ancient Aliens Live, though, that they feel like they're being discriminated against for believing in insane things. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but then there's other people who have argued that the UAP task force is kind of a waste of time and is like this, like, you know, big military boondoggle where they're putting a bunch of money into studying nonsense instead of, you know, real things. See, it's hard. It's hard to argue with that because on one hand, I'm like, yeah, it's nice to investigate if there are, you know, UAPs are 
real things that we just that we it would benefit to look into. But at the same time, I'm like, but yeah, we do have like the largest military budget ever, ever in the history of mankind, de- in the history of mankind. And we definitely have other things that we could be spending that money on that would better people's lives. Healthcare, a little education, more. education, infrastructure. Yeah, uh, it'd be good. Boring America, stuff that is um, good. Like knowing what UAPs are would be really cool. America having bridges that don't collapse would also be pretty cool. <laughs> that would be good too. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, we end up like with this sort of situation that always comes up though is that there's this, this delicate debate about uh, the public's right to know with, uh, you know, national security and the need for secrecy. And that, you know, it's depending upon how much the government wants to lean on one or the other. Because because the U.S. government does have a history of leaning too hard on secrecy, which breeds conspiracy theories. Uh, so hmm. I have proposed a handful of resolutions Whoa. to solve oh the my UAP gosh. issue. This is so new. We normally don't come with solutions. We normally just come with complaints. So yeah. this is new for us. I like this. Yeah. Okay. See, normally, if you're a new listener, we tend to end the episode with a section that's called the part where Tristan makes you sad. Uh, but this is this is unprecedented. We've never come with like actual solutions. So I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty stoked about this. Yeah, we're and trying my, to make everybody is, happy. He's Tristan. He's the, Tristan. he's Tristan is in the part, nothing. and I'm Scott. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> What a bit. Um, Okay. So first, I think that I am an advocate for transparency. I think that the government should not be doing shit with people's money and not telling the public, not making a public unless there's some like extremely good reason for it. Uh, So luckily this is happening. The Senate's UAP Disclosure Act of 2023 does mandate that all UAP records have to have a sort of time limit before they have to be made public so that nothing can stay secret forever. Uh, I think everything in the US government has to have a expiry date on anything that they label as secret but i might be wrong on that because i think that kind of stuff gets renewed and everything but maybe this is like you know this has to be made public by a certain time uh i also am very much into this idea that there's multiple different organizations looking into it for different reasons uh the all domain anomaly resort resolution office a a AARO, but also NASA working into it means that we're going to have multiple different analysts and different tools and resources that will result in, uh, like, I think a rather consistent pattern of them not being aliens. And also it means that like they can collaborate. And if they do more like open science, it means that we can advance our, our scientific understanding of this much more. And also collaboration between people, you know, (laughs) don't hide, not hiding information, collaborating. I feel like it's only, you know, there's only upside. Yeah. Yeah. I would also think that it would be better if the government was more um, engaging with the public, if they were to do hearings and consultations to uh, specifically because uh, the world has a problem when it comes to UAPs and UFOs, which is that it has built an elaborate anti-government conspiracy and that America has a not insignificant number of people who are really into these theories and their entire theory is based around a fundamental mistrust of the government and a like dislike for the government, which is uh, TBH 100% earned. Yep. One of the ways that they could mitigate this is that throughout their process of reporting, not only being public about it, but also consulting and engaging with the public about the stuff that they're doing as they're doing it. Uh, so that they can uh, they can have a sort of uh, a, a, a development of trust, because I think that a lot of a lot of UAP or a lot of UFO conspiracy theorists come from a place of having a fundamental uh, no trust of the government, which is fair. Yeah. But uh, but a way to mitigate that somewhat would be if the government were to be more open about, or more interactive. Yeah. Notice that Tristan is not saying that people need to be more trusting of the government, but yeah, rather that, that the government no, no, needs the worst to. Idea. No, no, no. Tristan is saying the government needs to earn people's trust back. Yes. And they yeah. need to be more honest. Like, I think that if they if they were to, I think that if specifically on the topic of UFOs, if they were to listen more to people and allow for more public, you know, uh, discussion and, 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 uh, participation in this process, that it would go a long way towards people thinking that this is all an elaborate conspiracy designed to hide the true things, which is that they have, uh, impo- physically impossible, uh, spaceships that can move at speeds that are literally impossible in a universe that has, uh, time. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, the other part too is that we should probably have a regular review of classified information. Things yeah. like the UAP Disclosure Act. I think that would mean that like every so often the government should go over everything that they have uh, locked under, you know, locked under secrecy and determine if they actually, if this actually still needs to be secret. And if it doesn't, then they should just release it because I think that the government errs towards keeping things secret rather than defaulting to public. And I think that it would be better if they were to be more on board with that. Uh, Absolutely. Were, which is the thing. And also furthermore, uh, that people should have, there should be strong whistleblower protection. Uh, those who mm-hmm. report UAPs should have uh, good lines of communication towards whoever is processing them because it can be damaging to the career. And I do think that if they made it so that it was too difficult to report them or that you would expose yourself to the public, that would, again, I think, hurt their relationship with the public about whether or not they're being you know, forthcoming and transparent about what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, protect those people. Yeah. And so then, uh, yeah, and, and in the future, I hope that this is going to result in some interesting things. Like, I hope that ARO and NASA means that there's going to be more independent study. There's going to be more collaboration between departments and more of uh, a dedication to transparent science, not just in, you know, UFO detection, but in other sort of endeavors, that there will be more open science available for people to do. And that, uh, that maybe this more open mind moves towards some being less dismissive and being more you know, the government doing more to improve science and our understanding of the world through openness and collaboration and transparency would go a long way to where it's the, the government yeah. being you know more democratic and people knowing what their government is doing so that they can you know decide whether they want to vote for the people who keep doing it etc cetera, etc cetera. and they just got to use this patent pending five step program mm-hmm. that you've created exactly and obviously like it's an ongoing phenomenon uh, there are unanswered questions some of these are still mysterious and there's still a lot of curiosity and research that needs to be done and that uh if uh and that as it's evolving there's going to be new discoveries and insights and i look forward to finding out what these things actually are at the end of the day i think that if we go in there you know with the preconceived idea that it's aliens we're going to dissuade ourselves from you know finding some interesting answers to what these actually are um but yeah that is that is um that's my sort of overall view of where we are when it comes to the uap phenomenon today i'm sure i'm going to not ruffle a single feather in this entire endeavor. Yeah, I think it's a good overview. Why is this stuff popping up so much? What's the history of it? What are some explanations? What can we do about it? That's sort of, we covered a lot of ground today. I say we, but it was mostly you. You, me, and you, but mostly me. It's from the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon. Yeah. yeah. Why not? I that's know. When we, that's I'm when, a nerd When we too. were starting the podcast, when we were having our meeting to start the podcast, that's how it went. It was like, you and me, but, but mostly, mostly me, me are going to change the world forever. That's how it, that's how it went. See, I told you we're a bunch of nerds mm-hmm. here on this podcast. And if you like listening to this podcast, then you can always follow us, uh, follow this podcast, subscribe, do whatever you need to do. And uh, let us know your thoughts over at Probs Not Aliens on Twitter and Blue Sky. We hand out Blue Sky codes every oh, so yeah, often. Oh, yeah, let me get my join us for you. Over here. Tristan's going to jump on that. In the meantime, I'll give Tristan a second thing to do, which is, Tristan, what else do you do online? Uh, I have and a where YouTube can people channel. find you? I have a YouTube channel called Step Back, which can be found at, at stepbackissue.com. And it is a channel where I try to make the world make sense by knowing about history, which is a thing that um, school didn't do a super good job at getting people to do. Uh, if you want to, the Blue Sky social code is uh, bsky social dash five i e b s dash s e w g two that's it first come first, first serve. come first serve free to a good home it's yeah, scott yep if i wanted to know the history of the superman parade balloon oh boy uh where would i need to go to find that so this is a fun bit that Tristan does at the end of, of these episodes <laughs> where he will pull from one of my very old videos because I've been on YouTube for about 10 years and he'll find one of my oldest ones that is not very good and he'll be like, well, how about this? Um, and that's from my YouTube channel called NerdSync, N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C. I have made so many videos about so many different things. I've got a bunch up right now. This is coming out in January. So hopefully I have a video where me and my wife explore the weird world of licensed cookbooks. We make a whole bunch of food from cookbooks that should never have been made. Uh, I have a copy of the D&D cookbook. I should mail it to you. 
Oh yeah, I didn't even try the D and we didn't do that one. We did Bob Ross. We did DC Comics, Marvel Comics. We have a Barbie one. We've got a Scooby Doo one. Obviously, it was a fun time. The Bob Ross one was very cute. So you can also look into uh, your detailed breakdown of the trailer for an upcoming show called The Flash coming to the CW. Oh my god. <laughs> Anyway, that's my ch- channel. And uh, I'm also just at Scott Nice Wonder everywhere. We don't really plug most of our other stuff. But anyway, yeah. a great place where you can find more information about this show and send people links to listen to it is a very simple website called probsnotaliens.com. Mm-hmm. It's got links to all the places where you can listen on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all the other podcast catchers and things that you want to check out. Um, this year, great. YouTube you is going to have podcasts. It'll be I'm interesting how YouTube's going to YouTube's gonna that gonna have podcasts. We have to figure that out. Yep. Uh, and yeah, and thanks you, thank you to everyone who writes reviews of this show on Apple podcasts and leaves comments on YouTube, I suppose, and leaves feedback on Spotify. There's so many different ways to engage. Yeah. And if you want to, uh, listen, uh, to next week's episode, a week early, one of the things that we do over at, uh, if you sign up for Nebula via nebula.tv slash probably not aliens, you could subscribe to this podcast. Episodes come out a week early and there are no ads telling you to sign up for Nebula to get episodes early. And they're not being ads. So except uh, for this part at the end, which yeah, we never a- edit out of the Nebula version. Fair enough. But we can say if you're listening on Nebula, thank you. Yes, it's it's great. Thank you for oh, listening on Nebula. So thank you so much for listening again, especially if this was your first episode. Let us know if we did a good job <laughs> of, of explaining this whole show. Until next time, once again, and so you know, my name is Scott Nicewander. I'm Tristan Johnson, and one of the things that I do at the end of the show is I say that the truth is out there, and then as the music swells, I then say probably. But I say probably in a different way every time. And then we do like a, there's a little bit afterwards. That's that's a funny thing yeah, that we do at the end of the show. This is the bit. This is the bit that happens afterwards. We do sometimes where we just talk about mm-hmm. a little a joke. Yeah, and then the video. Then then it ends, and then it's over. And then it ends, and then here's your next episode of whatever you're listening to.